four, three, two, one. Wow, and there it is, a successful landing on the ground. No need to play the clip any further. If you've followed this channel for any amount of time, you know that one of my goals is to propulsively land a model rocket, and I've been doing it with this vehicle called Scout. Scout is about one meter tall and 1.1 kilograms in mass. Honestly, this is a little bit of a bummer to say, but the last flight looked cleaner than this one. We didn't quite make it back to the landing pad and we hit the ground a little bit hard, but one of the more pronounced problems on this flight was the wiggle on the way up. In the last video, I talked about how this was due to poor modeling in the flight simulation. When we moved that rocket motor back and forth, I hadn't accounted for the momentum being whipped around. But as I took a closer look at the hardware, I realized that wasn't the full story of the problem. This 3D printed thrust vector control mount has just too much slop in the joints. If we look at high speed footage of the mount moving to 5 degrees, we can spot a lot of wiggle and bending, especially in some of those linkages. The plastic servo horn and the 1mm bent pushrod are certainly not doing us any favors. It also looks like some of the internal gearing of the servo has some looseness in there. So how do you fix an issue like this? The first thing that I tried is fixing it in software. This is equivalent to shooting a really bad piece of footage and saying, ah, I'll just fix it in post. It never works that well. Fixing it in software usually exists as a band-aid on a problem that should just be fixed in hardware. In a control loop for an actively stabilized rocket, you've got a rocket, which does rocket things, you've got a state estimator, like a Kalman filter that estimates position, velocity, attitude, you have a controller that takes in those measurements and generates a correction command for the TVC mount, and then you have the mount dynamics themselves. This is how a command turns into a real force on the rocket. On Scout, this whole loop runs at 50 hertz. The Kalman filter is actually much faster, up at like 400 hertz or something. But importantly, 50 times per second, we're running this whole loop to correct where the rocket is and where it's going to go. Some of the commands that we're sending to this mount at 50 hertz have really sharp spikes in them. And the spikes are what trigger that vibration in the rocket mount. If you're moving to a half a degree or one degree in the mount, it's not a huge deal. But if you tell it to slam to five degrees for a second, you're gonna induce a lot of that vibration. So what's a quick fix for smoothing out jumps in a discrete signal? An averaging filter, a moving average. We take the output of the controller from the rocket and add a small averaging window so that when the controller demands a sharp change in the TVC angle, the mount responds at a slightly more leisurely pace and doesn't do any of those hard motions that get us in trouble. Listen, look deep into my eyes here. If you're sitting there thinking, wow, this seems like a terrible idea, Joe is basically just adding a bunch of phase lag to his system and making all of his dynamics worse, you're correct. This is not a good idea. Am I proud of this decision? No. Do I recommend doing this kind of thing on other control systems? No. But does it solve the problems that we are having on Scout? Also no. I used this averaging filter on Scout Flight 2 to counteract the wiggle from Flight 1. Tuning the gains differently from Flight 1 to Flight 2 was just not enough to fix that vibration problem that we have on the vehicle. And the thing is, in order to make the averaging filter work, we had to severely loosen up on our position and velocity control. This means that on ascent, the rocket is making almost no effort to slide over to the landing pad, not because we aren't telling it to, but because the control system had to be so dulled down that it almost is isn't making a difference. This drift in position leads to the rocket overcorrecting on the way down to try and get back to the landing pad, but it is not effective enough and we slam into the ground. Okay, so this doesn't work. How do we fix it? Well, as they say in Barcelona, if you can't fix your control system with an averaging filter, you should probably try just using better actuators. This means it's time for a metal TVC mount. Here's the plan. I wanna pull all the stops on this hardware. So we're gonna start off with the fastest servos I can find. And, oh, how much does that cost? Oh, 
Uh, these little servos have a metal servo horn with an incredibly tight tolerance fit, so there's effectively no slop coming from the servos now. How about those Z-bent 1mm push rods before? Those are not good enough here. We're going to make our own custom length and shape linkages to push the mount, which gets rid of all of the bending there. As for the rest of the mount, all metal as well. If we're going to make some parts metal, we might as well do the whole thing, and then I'll get some good machining practice. The final mass of this hardware is about 106 grams, which, while heavier than the plastic mount, is still pretty reasonable. I was able to lighten up the rocket to compensate for this mass increase by reprinting several parts in a much less dense infill with only one thin shell layer, so the overall mass stays about the same. The next step in this process is to characterize how much wiggle there is in this design and how much better it is than the last mount. And before we start on that, one thing I'll mention here is that I am not a professional machinist. I've got my Tormach 440 mil in my garage, and I am just figuring and things out as we go. I stand by the design of this mount, but the machinist, me, did not do a good job fabricating it, so we still have a little bit of wiggle in here, but that's mostly due to my job machining it. To characterize the performance of this mount, I took an IMU and hot glued it onto the top. I did this with the old TVC mount as well. Then I wrote up a quick test program that actuates the mount to a few points and started collecting data. Running these types of tests can be pretty fun, but the more I work at this scale, the more I think that Scout F is kind of the wrong size to be building at. To be clear, I'm gonna fly this thing until it works. I'm not done until it lands. That said, if I were starting this from scratch, I think it would be a lot easier in terms of the flight time, actually fabricating parts, keeping your mass budget in check. I think it would be easier if it were like three or four times as big. Again, I'm still working on this right now. We're gonna fly this thing until it lands and I don't have plans for a bigger one yet, but just some food for thought. Once I captured this data, I popped over to the system ID toolbox in MATLAB and generated a transfer function to represent the dynamics of the TVC mount. Using this data, I was able to rerun all of the flight simulations for Scout, retune stability gains, and dial back that averaging filter, so we should have much better control on the way up now. To prepare the rocket for flight, I also beefed up the bottom of the landing leg mount, which had seen some damage from the last two flights. I then prepped the rocket motor, mounted and zeroed in the new TVC mount, and I ran plenty of pre-flight simulations to ensure that everything looked good on the rocket side. To do this, I use a software in the loop approach, which means that we take fake inertial data and inject it into the flight software on the actual rocket to trick itself into thinking it's flying. Once that was all complete, I loaded the new code onto the rocket and I headed out to the launch site. I fly these rockets right before dawn because it gives us basically no wind, but it does mean that I end up setting up in the dark. This is getting a little easier with every time I do it, and honestly, it feels kind of awesome to see the sky light up right before we lift off, but after setting up the landing pad with cardboard, a rug, and mylar to soften the touchdown, I calibrated the launch pad. This involves a high precision level to ensure that the rocket is truly all the way upright. Because of how heavy we rely on inertial measurements to get our position, velocity, attitude, etc. on the rocket, it's really important that we know exactly where we start and exactly where we're pointing when we lift off. I try to level the rocket to within at least a tenth of a degree, if not a little bit more, and I do that using an adjustable pad at the base. Once that was done, I set up the Patreon live stream. If you want to support this project, you can get access to all of the raw flight data, flight footage, launch live streams, and the BPS Discord by clicking the link in the description down below. And thank you to everyone who does support the project on Patreon, who has helped me afford these expensive servos and lots of rocket motors for testing. All right, I think we're ready. Nervous. Woo! Same thing as always. It might work. 
It might not. It probably won't. These things uh, don't often work for me. So keep your fingers crossed. We're gonna think good thoughts. The data looks okay to me. And you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work and we'll fly another day. Here's hoping we learn a little bit more. Okay. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, that was cleaner than the last one. So while we're still not there, I promise we are getting closer and closer to landing with each flight. Let's take a look at some of the good and bad parts of the flight here. First, there's no wiggle. That's still solved. And we have good control on the way up. We do have a super hard pitch over at launch, which is due to misalignment in the ascent motor and landing motor. Luckily, the rocket can handle it, but it gives us a pretty sporty liftoff. Looking at the altitude data on the way down, we actually do an all right job with throttle control. Getting this throttle system to work has been a tremendous effort. It's kind of crazy how much work it takes to just tell the rocket, this is how high I want you to be above the ground and try to contend that with the fixed burn time of a solid motor. The throttle control isn't totally perfect yet, but you can see the rocket clamp down and reduce thrust as we aim for altitude set points on the way down to the landing pad. The other thing to mention here is the period between the two burns. This area of flight is a little bit rough looking. I have some code in there to zero out the angular rates before the motor burns out, but clearly it is not working that well, since once we burn out, we start pitching over to the side. This leads to the other problem here, which is the landing pad. When I started work on Scout F, I knew that in theory, we should be able to target a point on the ground, maybe let's say one meter by one meter. So if we make the pad big enough, it should be okay. This has not really panned out in practice and it's for a few reasons. The first reason is this startup period of the burn, which can happen at a rough angle. On Scout E, we fixed this problem by going higher with a lighter weight vehicle, coasting for longer and popping out fins to stabilize. Unfortunately, we don't really have the mass budget to add fins like that on this vehicle. That budget is getting eaten up by a heavier airframe and now an aluminum TVC mount. But even if we did have the mass budget for that, there is another problem here. Let's walk back to that simulation part of the video earlier. Remember that step before the controller, the estimator? In order to control where it's going, the rocket has to know where it is. You know that video that's like the missile knows where it is? That's what we're talking about right now. The missile knows where it is at all times. It knows this because it knows where it isn't. Right now, Scout doesn't know where it is as well as it needs to. With each launch, I like to stick a wide angle camera on the ground to capture the full flight along each of the horizontal axes, Y and Z. This lets me evaluate how accurate our position estimates are through the flight. So when the vehicle reaches the peak of flight, we can draw a line from the launch pad straight up and we can compare where the vehicle is and where it thinks it is. At Apogee, these errors are not that significant. We're only about five seconds into flight here, but when we play the clip forward, we find some more concerning data. On the Z-axis, while the real position looks to be between two and three meters in the negative direction, the flight data shows that the rocket believes it's almost a half a meter positive on the Z-axis, an error which is larger than the size of the landing pad itself. So this is no good. Even with the precision leveling that I do on the rocket before launch, we are still not getting inertial estimates that are close enough to land this thing where we want it. There are some ways to fix this with hardware. We could use differential GPS or RTK GPS, real-time kinematic, and that can get a centimeter level accuracy with a base station. We could also use some radio range finder setup where we triangulate between several ground stations to tell the rocket where it is in flight. But the thing is, the only reason we really need the landing pad is to prevent that bounce when the rocket touches down. This is the thing that has plagued me for a billion years with landing model rockets. The bounce is what gets me. So if we can figure out a way to get the rocket to not bounce, 
mouse, we don't need the landing pad anyway, so we're gonna ditch the pad. We're flying in an open area with plenty of ground to land on, and in the next video you'll see how I eliminate the bounce from the landing legs and ditch the pad altogether. It's the summer of Scout, and I am not gonna let up on this project until we land one of these things, and ideally land it a couple of times to just show that it is reliable. I have plenty of rocket motors, plenty of time, and a ridiculous burning desire to make this project work. If you want to follow along with launch live streams, raw footage, flight data, and Discord access, you can do that by clicking the Patreon link down below and supporting the project. Thank you so much to the folks who keep that running over there, and thank you to you for watching, sharing the video, just giving me a few minutes of your time. That means a lot to me, and it helps me keep doing these crazy projects. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.